you doing? Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the symposium, Decolonizing the Borderlands, Root Causes, Resilience, and Resistance. Co-sponsored by the Center on Immigration and the Barbara and John Jordan Center for Children of Trauma and Domestic Violence Education. I'm Miguel Rodriguez. I'm a faculty member here at Cabrini University and director of the Center on Immigration. We're excited to engage in a candid discussion of the realities at the U.S.-Mexico border. The border industrial complex is designed to exclude, imprison, and criminalize people who are fleeing pervasive poverty, persecution, and violence. Over several decades, border policies have continuously escalated to be increasingly punitive to people in migration, culminating in the current systematic abuses of people's legal and human rights. As U.S. influence and intervention abroad continue to cause forced migration, border policies have become more restrictive. It is in this context that border advocates work for justice for people in migration. We are fortunate to have various experts with us today to help us understand the reality in the borderlands. In the tradition of Mother Cabrini, the patron saint of immigrants, our centers seek to educate others and engage with them in social justice efforts. We are grateful to our guests for joining us in these efforts today. Through their impactful research and reporting, advocacy and activism, they fight for the human rights and human dignity of immigrant communities, and we look forward to hearing from them. We're also grateful for the institutional support we have received in advancing our work and in coordinating this event. One of our most ardent allies is Cabrini's Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Chioma Ugochukwu. We would like to invite her to say a few words at this time. that 
each day we see more stories of the crisis and we wonder about the solutions. I'm grateful to our Center on Immigration and the Jordan Center for the joint effort to educate us this morning, not only on solutions, but the history, root causes, and implications of policies around this humanitarian crisis. As we explore the subject of trauma, as it relates to the migrant experience, I'm reminded of cases some of us as college administrators witnessed of students traumatized by their own individual experiences and the plight of their family members. We also know the impact on international education, which continues to shrink in the face of fear. I'm proud of the work of our centers to provide awareness and advocacy on these serious issues. We welcome and thank our guests, including Juan D. Gonzalez, today's keynote speaker, and our panelists who are in the trenches and doing the work to help us understand the psychological impact of trauma, for instance, working to ease suffering of our border, on our borders and confronting systemic human rights abuses. I'm also grateful to our namesake, St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, one of the reasons I'm so proud to be an employee here at Cabrini University, one of the reasons I took this job. The patron saint of immigrants and progress of our sponsoring order, which is the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, on whose shoulders we stand. Mother Cabrini, as you all know, was an immigrant herself, and her story is like many other stories of immigrants. She arrived in New York on March 31st, 1889, with six members of the MSCs to work among the Italian immigrants who were finding neither welcome nor prosperity at that time. We know from news reports that in order to support their first orphanage, they found what little funds they could in Little Italy and somehow managed to set up a tiny hospital. Mother Cabrini really traveled for the next 28 years, setting up schools, hospitals, orphanages, and novitiates in different US cities, including Philadelphia. She became a US citizen a decade later, and this citizenship gave her the distinction of being the first United States saint. She sets the example for us, and we stand on her legacy and her commitments to social justice, her care of persons in need. Thanks again to the Center on Immigration and the Jordan Center and everyone who has made this symposium possible. We are excited to have all of you here this morning and hopefully, if nothing else, maybe you will learn what it's like out there and also what it takes for us to be compassionate toward one another. After all, that's what God calls us to do. Welcome to Korea. Thank you. 
to welcome our keynote speaker. Juan Gonzalez is one of the country's best known journalists. For nearly 30 years, he was a staff columnist for New York's Daily News, and he has been a co-host for more than two decades of Democracy Now!, a daily morning news show that airs on more than 1,300 public radio and television stations across the United States and Latin America. His investigative reports on urban policy, race relations, the labor movement, and Latin America have garnered numerous accolades, including two George Polk Awards. Before entering journalism, Gonzalez was a well-known 1960s activist. As a key figure of the Columbia University Student Revolt of 1968, and later as a leader of the militant group, the Young Lords. Born in Ponce, Puerto Rico, he was raised in East Harlem and Brooklyn, New York. He received his BA from Columbia University, and is currently a professor of journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. Please join me in welcoming Juan Gonzalez. Thank you and good morning to everyone. I want to thank the Center on Immigration 
and the Barbara, Jordan, Barbara and John Jordan Center for Children of Trauma and Domestic Violence Education, especially Abel Rodriguez and Professor Jennifer Bullock, and to the faculty here at Cabrini for organizing such a timely and much needed symposium. For the theme you've chosen, a theme that perfectly expresses the challenge facing the American public right now on the issue of immigration, and for inviting me to share some words with you. You know, I actually have a connection that goes back many decades to, Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia area, and especially to this section of the main line. Uh, many years ago, back in the 1970s, I was a young uh, reporter here at a newspaper called Suburban and Wayne Times. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and uh, so I would take the train in from Philadelphia to, uh, all the way to Wayne, Pennsylvania to work every day and got to know this area uh, fairly well. I even came, I guess it was about more than 40 years ago to an event here at Cabrini uh, where Geraldo Rivera, of all people, was speaking, <laughs> was speaking at Cabrini uh, at the time. As you've heard, I'm now mostly a professor of journalism at Rutgers University. But I've always considered myself more a professional journalist than a professor or historian, having devoted uh, some 40 years now to reporting day-to-day -day events in the areas of urban politics, economics, crime, and law enforcement, labor, and race relations. What in my profession we typically refer to as hard news. I've been fortunate to earn my living bearing witness to thousands of events, big and small, interviewing the famous, the infamous, and the little known, then trying to explain often complex subjects in a way that makes sense to a broader public. And unlike most of my colleagues, I've done so within the three distinct and separate streams of the press in America. The corporate or commercial or for-profit media, such as the Daily News, where I worked not only at the New York Daily News, but for about uh, 10 years at the Philadelphia Daily News as well. Also, the alternative non-commercial or progressive media, such as Democracy Now!, where I've been there since 1996 as co-host, and at times in the ethnic press or minority press that was formed by journalists of color who were for so long excluded or marginalized from both the corporate and commercial media, and the alternative and dissident press. Each of these represent part of the complex thing we call the American media. Each has its own proud origins. The commercial press, as media historians know, go back to Benjamin Harris and public occurrences in 1690 and John Campbell's Boston Newsletter in 1708, through the great newspapers forged in the late 19th century by the titans like William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer and E.W. Scripps, to the broadcast and cable networks of our day like CBS, CNN, Fox, to the aggregators and navigation applications of the internet such as Google News, Yahoo News, Politico, Huffington Post, etc. But the alternative and dissident and non-commercial press also boasts its own proud tradition from the working men's press of the 1830s to the muckrakers like Lincoln Steffens and Upton Sinclair and Ida Tarbell of the early 20th century to the new left papers of the 1970s uh, to community radio stations like Pacifica and shows like Democracy Now! with Amy Gubin that I've been privileged to work with for now for a, almost a quarter century to the to the progressive internet sites like Common Dreams, Alternet, Intercept, and Daily Costs. And then there's the press by people of color. Going back to John Russworm and Samuel Cornish, Freedom's Journal, 1827, Philadelphia, the first African-American newspaper in the world, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. From the press and the pulpit, we have suffered much by being incorrectly represented. First editorial in the first black newspaper in the world. You could write it today, and it would have the same resonance or the Latino press that developed in this country, 1808 in Mississippi, and, uh, and uh, 1824 right here in Philadelphia, a, a, uh, a Catholic priest, refugee from Cuba, Felix Varela, establishes El Habanero, one of the first Spanish language uh, periodicals here in the United States. Felix Varela was actually a predecessor of, of Mother Cabrini. He, was, he eventually rose to become the vicar general of the 
Catholic Archdiocese of New York became the premier def uh, defender of immigrants in America, in New York. Only most of the immigrants back then in the 1830s and 40s were Irish. So he ministered to the Irish immigrant community and became one of the premier theologians of the Catholic Church. Founded the Catholic Expositor and numerous other publications uh, and was really one of the premier intellectual uh, giants of the Catholic Church in America in the 19th century. Yet he was a Cuban refugee who fought for independence and the abolition of slavery in Cuba and was hunted by the Spanish monarchy all his life. So that, uh, I've been privileged to work at all three of these presses, and so I come to you talking about this issue of immigration from uh, the perspective of uh, all the different approaches that the press in America has taken to the narrative. During all that time, I've done something else most of my colleagues rarely do, studied and analyzed the social role of our mass media system. I've become acutely aware of the extraordinary role news media play in creating the memory bank and the narrative myths of any nation. Newspapers, after all, were long called the first draft of history, at least until the rise of the internet and the birth of social media turned everybody with a smartphone into a multimedia cub reporter and publisher. The incidents the media chose to report, their interpretation of events, inevitably serve as a raw material that is then mined by scholars who come decades or centuries later to chisel more comprehensive historical accounts. It is thus from the perspective of a working and hopefully conscious journalist, one who has studied and covered migration for more than 50 years, that I offer some of my thoughts on our nation's great immigration debate in general, the deepening conflict at our southern border in particular, and the roots of the migration crisis. Latinos, of course, are at the center of most immigration controversies in our time, given that the fact that about 50% of all migration to the U.S. since World War II has come from Latin America, and that about two-thirds of the undocumented immigrants are from that region. I should note that annual migration from India and China has in recent years surpassed that from Mexico, which for decades was the largest sender nation, even as we've witnessed an unprecedented increase in asylum seekers and refugee applicants from Central America in the past few years. The number of asylum seekers from that region skyrocketed from about 18,000 in 2011 to 294,000 at the end of last year, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, that number grew by 58% last year alone. How and why has this happened? What does massive migration signal for this country? Is it a danger and a curse? as some would argue, or is it a blessing, a basis for renewal and renaissance of the best of the American dream? That's the basic question, after all. I will be frank. We face today an unprecedented demagogic assault on the country's immigrant and Latino population on the foundational belief of this nation as a refuge for peoples fleeing danger and seeking a better life. The assault comes directly from the White House and a large section of the ruling party in control, and it threatens the very basis of our democracy. The words of a president matter, after all. Words such as build the wall and Mexico will pay for it, telling black and Latino congresswomen to go back to the country where they came from. Such words grab headlines. They drive the news coverage. They're analyzed and dissected by thousands of government bureaucrats, by the leaders of other countries, and they inspire reaction by his most fervent opponents and supporters, sometimes with tragic consequences, as we saw this summer in the tragic attack on Latinos in El Paso by a crazed white supremacist. When a leader tramples facts so often and with such disdain, so will his followers. The world is familiar, but too often forgets other tragic examples of physical walls erected between peoples. The Berlin Wall, for example, that once separated East and West Germany. The wall built by Israel to separate Palestinian and Jews in the West Bank. And of course, the most famous of them all, the 1,500 mile long Great Wall of China 
which took that country's emperors centuries to build against the Huns, and which remains our planet's greatest testament to human insecurity. But I hope in the minutes I have left this morning to puncture a far more dangerous barrier, a psychological one. Call it the Great Wall of Ignorance that deeply divides the American public when it comes to immigration, to Latinos, and to the roots of the immigrant crisis today. Sadly, so much of the immigration debate is marked by a tendency from those who yell the loudest to generate more heat than light, more one-sided sloganeering than dispassionate discourse, more stoking of the worst emotions among the American people, rather than an honest attempt to understand the roots of the problem than devise the most humane and sensible solutions. For Latinos in particular, the debate has led to widespread scapegoating and fear mongering. And when, it, and when we, we talk about the Latino community in the United States, we're talking about an extremely complex and rapidly evolving subset of the general population. There are now some 59.8 million people of Latin American descent in the United States. Uh, about 18.3% of the population. That's according to the latest U.S. Census figures that came out a few weeks ago, uh, the American Community Survey for 2018. It's actually 64 million if you include the more than 3.2 million U.S. citizens who live on the island of Puerto Rico, but which the Census Bureau never includes when it counts the U.S. Latino population. That is an astounding number when you consider that less than 50 years ago, when I was the age of many of you students in this room, the Latino population of the United States was just 9.1 million. It represented a mere 4.5% of the population. So the first thing that you must grasp is that we are all living through and witnessing an historic transformation of the very composition of US society. And the narratives we absorb and then spread to others about migration and about Latino thus become critically important. When I attended public schools in New York City during the 1950s and the early 1960s, the history books and the narratives were far different than they are today. It was as if the only things worth recording back then when it came to heroic figures, politics, science, literature, art, and industry was what had happened in Europe or among the descendants of the European settlers who ventured out to settle or colonize enclaves in the Western Hemisphere, Africa, and Asia. The overwhelming majority of our planet, the non-white peoples, were still shrouded in darkness, or at least some lesser and inferior forms of cultural developments, as far as the narratives explained. As someone born in Puerto Rico but raised all my life in the United States, I learned virtually nothing in school about my own homeland, a U.S. territory and perhaps the most valuable overseas possession the United States has ever held. And so it was for so many Mexican, Cuban, Dominican, Salvadoran, Guatemalan, Honduran, Colombian, Panamanian children who, like myself, grew up right here in the United States. Likewise, for millions of African American, Native American, and Asian children. The stirring saga of settlers conquering the West to create the world's greatest democratic experiment somehow excluded those of us who had not come from Europe. Uh, most importantly, the news media we grew up with kept depicting us as threats to society rather than contributors. West Side Story, one of the great Broadway musicals and films in the nation's history, ingrained in millions of Americans a stereotype of a Puerto Rican as a gang member with a knife and slick back hair, just as Birth of a Nation decades before had shaped the images of black Americans uh, for many uh, whites in the country. The invariably lurid stories of black and Latino criminals, which you hear now mouthed by people in the highest positions in the land, produced by my own colleagues, many of them exaggerated, some vastly distorted, infuriated me. Because I knew from the experiences and stories of my own family and other hardworking immigrants that the news and edited and out of context. Even after I graduated from Columbia University and got involved in social group, activist groups like the Young Lords and the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, and later after I embarked on a career in journalism, I couldn't understand why despite all the progress in civil rights and equal opportunity of the past 50 years, the news media kept depicting racial and ethnic minorities in such a one-sided, stereotypical, and negative manner 
So I made up my mind years ago to embark on my own journey into the historical record, to search for material the textbooks and previous scholars had overlooked and the media reports had failed to acknowledge. The first product of that search was a book, Harvest of Empire, which was published back in 2000. And it was, I updated it in 2011. I'm updating it again right now. Uh, and to my complete surprise, given that I was making my first foray into writing history, that it's become a very popular text in about 200 colleges across the country this day, these days. And more than a decade ago, a group of Latino filmmakers in Washington, D.C. Uh, did a full-length documentary based on it. I think some of, some of you may have seen it last night. I think it was screened here la last night. Uh, the main themes of both my book and the film is that you cannot understand the presence of so many Latinos in this country and of the immigration crisis today unless you first understand the historic role of the United States in Latin America and around the world. The Latinos of this country are the harvest of empire. It's an unintended harvest. It's the, their direct result of America's policies of military intervention and economic exploitation of Latin America during the 19th and early 20th centuries most of which have been largely erased from public memory and even from most of the basic history textbooks. The United States, however, as, has been, as was mentioned by the provost, is not the only nation confronting an immigration crisis. We've seen the heartbreaking images of boat people crossing the Mediterranean to get to Italy, Greece, and the Balkan states with thousands perishing at sea in their attempts and tens of thousands reaching Europe and overwhelming the resources of those countries to process or handle them. And where are these immigrants coming from? From Syria, from Libya, from Iraq, from Somalia, from Yemen. Countries where during the past two decades, our own governments, military interventions, occupations, targeted bombings, assassinations, have unfortunately and tragically led to greater violence and instability among those peoples than previously existed. These sudden surges of people fleeing one country for another do not arise from thin air or from thousands of individual families suddenly making decisions made to simply seek a better life in another country. Rather, they are mass manifestations of profound flaws in the economic and political systems of our modern world. Much of it, I would submit to you, is the unintended harvest of past colonial empires and more recently of a new form of economic and political domination commonly referred to as globalization. Ever since the end of World War II, the peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, a region some once called the Third World and today is sometimes referred to as the Global South, have been coming to the West. England doesn't know what to do about all the Pakistanis and Indians and Jamaicans. France doesn't know what to do about all the Algerians, Tunisians, and Moroccans. Germany doesn't know what to do about all the Turks and now increasingly the Syrians. And in the United States, our leaders have grappled for decades for what to do about all the Latin American and Caribbean peoples and increasingly now Africans and Asians that have migrated here. The key thing to understand is that the migrations have come from the very countries, though the receiving countries once dominated when they were colonial powers. The reason there are so many Algerians and Tunisians and Moroccans in France is because those were the colonies of France. The reason there are so many Indians and Pakistanis and Jamaicans in England is because those were the colonies of England. And the reason there are so many Latin Americans and Caribbean peoples in the United States is because those were the countries where the American empire was first built and erected. Those mass migrations have been going on for several decades now in this country and are now reaching what scientists call critical mass, where they have begun to transform the actual composition of the receiving nations. We commemorated a few years ago the 50th anniversary of the Immigration Act of 1965, the last major reform of our immigration sister, sometimes referred to as the Hart Seller Bill. It ended the previous policy, which had been effectively a racist policy that favored immigration from northern European white countries, and it organized in a new and more democratic system of granting immigration visas. 
that system equalized the number of migrants admitted each year into the U.S. and really paved the way for the current racial and ethnic diversity of the country. The immigration system, though, has been broken for decades, and ever since the great uh, immigrant protests of 2006, our leaders in Washington have repeatedly tried but failed to come up with a new, modern, comprehensive immigration reform. There's a reason they haven't been able to agree. The fight over immigration reform today is largely a battle over what kind of nation we are going to be in the 21st century. Who comes in and who doesn't? Who can legitimately claim to be an American? And there are many in the country, not a majority, but still a powerful, if diminishing, minority who still cling to an image, an identity, a mythical narrative of an America that looks like them, white, Christian, and of European descent. No matter that this mythical country never really existed, that there have been, always been Native Americans and African Americans, many of them Muslims and Latinos that were here dur during the nation's founding, still, that minority clings to the myth and the notion of, of white supremacy and have become an integral part of that, uh, that's become an integral part of their identity. Latinos, however, are in a unique position among the modern migrant groups. We come from a region of the world that has not only provided the bulk of this country's new migrants for the past 50 years, but some of us trace our heritage to families that were living on what is now the U.S. before it was the U.S. in places like South Texas, northern New Mexico, southern Colorado, uh, uh, California, and of course the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico, Latinos there say we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Right? Puerto Rico, for example, has been a U.S. possession for 121 years since the Spanish-American War of 1898. Its residents have been U.S. citizens since 1917. But Puerto Ricans were living on that tiny Caribbean island for 400 years before the Americans came, with their own language, their own culture, and their own way of life. And during all that time as a U.S. possession, the labor of Puerto Ricans on the island has provided immense profit and wealth to companies and businesses in the United States, first in the production of sugar, then in cheap manufacturing, more recently in pharmaceuticals, and now for the last 10 years, uh, in interest to Wall Street bondholders on billions of dollars in debt. Yet the enormous contributions of those early Latino settlers are rarely acknowledged. Uh, the, you know, half of Mexico was taken in the, in the Mexican-American War. It became California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, Utah, etc. And the, the enormous wealth that came out of that territory uh, beginning with the gold rush of California and the silver mines of Nevada, uh, throughout the 19th and early 20th century, Mexicans were the main labor force of the Southwest, especially in the cattle and horse industry of Texas, which supplied much of the nation's beef. Uh, between 1838 and 1940, Arizona supplied much of the copper that helped produce the electrical lines of all of the Northeast and the Midwestern United States, and most of the miners pulled that copper out of the ground were Mexican. The sheep industry of New Mexico provided the wool to clothe much of the nation and as early as the 1870s, and most of the sheep herders were Mexican and Navajo. And then there were the railroads. Between 1880 and 1930, two-thirds of all the track workers in the West, the Southwest, and Midwest on U.S. railroads were Mexican laborers. But as the U.S. spread its territory westward, it also transformed many of the countries of the Western Hemisphere into economic satellites in its own spheres of influence. The number of interventions, military interventions, by the United States in Central America and the Caribbean is almost endless. Uh, it's hard to catalog the many examples uh, one of my favorites was uh, William Walker, and how many of you have heard of William Walker, who in 1855 went down to Nicaragua. Uh, he was hired to help uh, a political leader there train uh, his, the Nicaraguan army. He proceeded to organize a military coup in Nicaragua, take over the presidency, declared himself president of Nicaragua, uh, and, uh, and uh, reinstituted slavery, which had been abolished. <laughs> 
uh, in Nicaragua for decades, and then proceeded to recruit thousands of Americans who went down to Nicaragua and took up all the major government positions. The American, American migrants ran Nicaragua in the 1850s. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, William Walker was welcomed to the White House. There were Broadway plays done. He was a folk hero in the 1850s. He was also uh, a, uh, a megalomaniac and a racist uh, and a dictator. And he was eventually forced out by the combined armies of, of Nicaragua, uh, of Nicaragua and Honduras uh, and some of the other Central American countries. Uh, but he was just one example. There have been so many uh, interventions. Uh, uh, the Teddy Roosevelt's adventures, uh, first in creating the nation of Panama. You know, Panama was not a nation until Teddy Roosevelt created it. Uh, Panama was a province of Colombia, uh, but uh, the U.S. government couldn't get the Colombian government to agree to build, to give it a, 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 a concession to build the Panama Canal. So basically, Teddy Roosevelt hooked up a deal with some Panamanian dissidents to declare independence. Uh, and then he was, sent the Navy in to guarantee their independence revolt and immediately signed the treaty that brought the Panama Canal. So Panama was created as a nation just for the United States to build the Panama Canal. Uh, and in the process, the Panama Canal Company imported about 35,000 West Indians and Jamaicans to build the canal. Uh, in Panama, so they actually changed the entire racial and ethnic composition of the Panamanian population in the process. Uh, whether you go to United Fruit Company and all its efforts uh, in Guatemala and Honduras and, and Cuba, and, uh, and or whether you deal with the uh, multiple invasions of the Dominican Republic, first one in 1916, uh, uh, and then the second one in 1965, the totally restructured Dominican society. Uh, to favor American business, uh, or the multiple, uh, the multiple interventions uh, in Cuba uh, that occurred in the early 20th century, uh, and, uh, or the intervention in Nicaragua, the U.S. military in the 1920s that brought to power the Somoza family. And uh, all of these interventions ended up bringing into power dictators uh, that oppressed their countries. All of it, you can trace back to an original decision of American businessmen who were down there uh, or, um, uh, or uh, to bring in the U.S. military uh, to make the countries more open to U.S. business. No intervention went on longer, though, or was more profound than what happened in Mexico. Over the last few decades of the 19th century, the vast Mexican countryside evolved into an unprecedented laboratory for the spread of U.S. economic control over a foreign country. Mexico became, in effect, the incubator of the future American colonial empire with the acquiescence of the notorious Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz. By the time a revolution erupted against Diaz in 1910, U.S. investment in Mexico had surpassed $1.5 billion in 1910 dollars. Right? By then, as one study later noted, American capitalists owned 78% of Mexico's mines, 72% of its smelters, 58% of its oil, and 68% of its rubber business. Americans not only owned more holdings than all other foreigners, foreign capitalists combined, they owned more than the Mexican people themselves. And it was not just a handful of industrial titans who were involved in extracting Mexico's wealth the Rockefellers, the Guggenheims, E.H. Harriman, J.P. Morgan, Cyrus McCormick, Peter Grace, Joseph Headley Dulles, the great-grandfather of John Foster Dulles, who later became a Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. All of these families had huge holdings uh, in Mexico. But as historian John Mason Hart has meticulously documented, by 1910, there were more than 40,000 Americans living in Mexico. Of those, of those 15,000 had acquired land, and their holdings amounted to more than 130 million acres, 27% of all of Mexico's surface area was owned by Americans right, in 1910. The biggest of those owners, 160 individuals and corporations, each owned 
100,000 acres or more. Digest that. There were 160 people, Americans, who owned more than 100,000 acres each of land. Some owned 2 million acres. The Hearst family, William Hearst and his mother Phoebe, owned 8 million acres of land in Mexico before the revolution of 1910. And that revolution was the first great people's revolution of the 20th century. It sought to kick out all this foreign investment and to overthrow the dictator Porfirio Diaz that had created, uh, who had basically allowed Mexico to be pillaged. But the empire that US expansion created produced an unexpected harvest here at home toward the end of the 20th century. Massive Latino immigration. As US capital penetrated the region, it dislocated Latin Americans from their land, impoverished them, then recruited them into a ragtag army of low priced labor, wandering along carefully charted migratory routes, re circuits. You know, in the Midwest, in places like Iowa, and you know, Dodge City, Kansas now is more than 50% Latino. How did Latinos get to Dodge City, Kansas. How did they get to Des Moines, Iowa? Well, the meatpacking industry in the 80s, when they broke all the unions and created two-tier wage systems, then started recruiting, uh, hiring companies to go down to Mexico to recruit migrant workers to come up into the Midwest to be the, the new meatpacking labor force. Uh, I, I was down in Northwest Arkansas a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was stunned by the number of Guatemalans and Mexicans that are in Northwest Arkansas, all of them recruited by the chicken processing industry. Tyson Foods is, is a major, uh, that's their, their, their hub in Northwest Arkansas. So there was, there was a systematic recruitment of cheap labor to come up uh, to work in the United States. It is critically important to understand this history of exploitation, to recognize the enormous contributions of Latin America, and, uh, Latin America and of Latinos in this country when others try to disseminate stereotypes of Mexico sending criminals here. Even today, the most menial and least appreciated work in the United States is performed by Latino migrants. Those who pick the fruits and vegetables that nourish us, who butcher the meat and the poultry we consume, who tend our lawns and repair our roofs, who build our houses and haul our waste, who clean the hotels we use and the office buildings where we work, who wash the dishes and clear the tables and restaurants where we eat, who keep our universities clean and sparkling, or invariably Latino or other immigrants. Well, what about these street gangs? the president is always referring to. What do they have to do with US intervention? Well, how about everything? During the 1980s, there was a giant wave of Central American refugees into the United States. Those refugees were a direct result of the civil wars in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, all of them fueled by US military aid and intervention on the side of right-wing governments and paramilitary groups. There were just 94,000 Salvadorans living in the United States in 1980. A decade later, there were 700,000. Likewise, the Guatemalan population jumped from 71,000 in 1980 to 226,000 10 years later. And the Nicaraguan population from just 25,000 to 125,000. Many of the young people who fled back then after being traumatized by those wars settled with their parents in the barrios of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Houston, on Long Island, Washington, D.C., and where they grew up. A small but significant percentage ended up in street gangs like MS-13, which was born in Los Angeles. MS-13 is a product of, of the United States, was, was born in Los Angeles. Uh, and many ended up doing time in the U.S. prison system. But once they were released, since many had never achieved legal status, they were deported back to their home countries. And of course, they got no rehabilitation while they were in prison. They only got to be, learn how to be uh, more hardened criminals. Between 1998 and 2005, the United States deported some 46,000 ex-felons to Central America. Three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, received more than 90% of all deportations for, during that period. So the mass deportation of felons 
for that, that period of time all went to Central America, right? Many of them were members of the 18th Street and Salvatrucha gangs who had arrived in the U.S. as toddlers but had never secured legal residency. They joined the gangs as a way to feel included in a receiving country that uh, often actively impeded their integration. Once being sent back to the countries of origin, they barely knew those countries, the deportees reproduced the structures and behavior patterns that had provided them with support and security in the United States. They swiftly founded local clicas or chapters of their gang in the communities of origin. In turn, those clicas attracted other uh, unemployed youth. And of course, the availability of US guns combined with these US raised deportees produced the killing fields of Central, that Central America has now become. The homicide rate in New York City today is 1.4 per 100,000. Chicago, which is notorious because it still has a pretty high crime rate, is 18.6 per 100,000. Keep those numbers in mind. Honduras has the world's highest murder rate. El Salvador is number two. Guatemala is ninth. Eight of the world's 50 deadliest cities in 2016 were in Central America. In the city of San Salvador, the homicide rate is 130 per 100,000. Remember, New York is 1.8, <laughs> Chicago's 18. San Salvador is 130 homicides per 100,000 people. Uh, in uh, San Pedro Sula in Honduras uh, is 105. Tegucigalpa is 80. This is the rates of murder. We have, we have in essence, incubated criminals, deported them to these countries, supplied them with guns, and now they are terrorizing uh, their, uh, the countries that they uh, were born in but never knew. Even when people fleeing cartels prove their, imminent, their life is in imminent danger, our immigration judges will deny their claims, saying it, ju it is just generalized violence. Uh, and so uh, U.S. courts denied 88% of the asylum applicants from Mexicans between 2012 and 2017, 79% from El Salvador, 78% from Honduras. Uh, so the people from Central America get denied asylum claims. Meanwhile, only 20% of applications from China get denied asylum. Uh, and, uh, and China doesn't have anywhere near uh, the killing fields uh, that, uh, that Central America has become. As for getting tough on murderers and drug dealers who are here illegally, uh, which is something that the current administration often mentions. The facts reveal a completely different story. Former Attorney General Jeff Sessions himself reported uh, back in 2018 that 52% of all federal prosecutions in the United States were for immigration violations. Of all, of, all the federal prosecutions in the United States, more than half are for immigration. And only about 1% of those are for people convicted of violent crimes. So we're talking about a federal prosecution system that is zeroing in on immigrants and mostly nonviolent offenders. The, the administration keeps talking about the crime rates uh, as a result of immigrants when the facts are completely different. Fact-based research shows, as, uh, as one meta-study by Charles Kubrick at the University of California, Irvine, found out that um, uh, where you have immigrants, you have less violent crime than in areas where you don't have immigrants. And of course, we're now seeing the enormous, uh, have been seeing now for several years, the enormous crackdown and the detention situation of uh, not just prosecuting people, but jailing and detaining them. I want to read to you a couple of lines from a, the Guardian newspaper article that just came out in September. I think it best expresses what's going on. Children sleeping on floors, changing other children's diapers. Families torn apart at the border. Migrants crammed into fetid detention centers. Many will join more than 52,000 immigrants confined in jails, prisons, tents, and other forms of detention. Most of them for profit. 
The United States' reliance on immigration detention is not a new phenomenon, nor did it emerge with Donald Trump, though its growth under his administration is staggering. Over the last four decades, a series of emergency stopgap and bipartisan deals has created a new multi-billion dollar industry on the incarceration of immigrants. The people held in prison-like facilities across the country are not serving time for a crime. They are waiting for a hearing to determine if they can legally remain in the country while being kept in what is considered civil detention. Forty years ago, this system did not exist. We have thousands of thousands of people being jailed who are, are convicted of no crime. All they're doing is waiting for a hearing, and about 2,500 of those are children. Uh, and all they're doing is waiting for a hearing as to whether they can, uh, uh, they can uh, be admitted into the country. Today, the federal budget for immigration is greater than the budget of the FBI, the Secret Service, the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, the ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the Customs combined. All of those agencies have a smaller budget than the immigration budget of the federal government. We have an exploding uh, industry in immigration uh, persecution in this country that is replacing the prison industrial complex as the normal state prisons and local prisons increasingly uh, change their laws and release people from prison. There's a new prison system development uh, in immigration. Uh, however, there are lots of things happening right now that we need to pay attention to. On November 12th, the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments on uh, President Trump's attempt to eliminate DACA. All right, this will be a, a critical case that will be decided soon. Uh, 700,000 young people have been protected by DACA now since uh, President Obama initiated that plan. President Trump tr has tried to cancel it, but federal judges in numerous states have halted him from doing so. So now the Supreme Court will hear that case, and it'll be critically important to see what happens with the DREAMers. But the attack on immigration is not just on undocumented, and this is why it's so important to understand what, what is happening uh, 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 in not only in the United States, but in the rest of the world. Refugee admissions have plummeted. Right? There were 110,000 authorized under uh, the last year of the Obama administration. They went down to 40-something thousand, then they went down to 23,000. Now the administration has said that they plan for next year to have only 18,000 refugees admitted into the United States. Uh, there's the public charge law, which is, this is geared at legal folks. This is not ge geared at undocumented. The public charge law, which only a couple of days ago was blocked in the federal courts as well. Uh, uh, under the new rule, uh, if you receive Medicaid or supplemental uh, SNAP uh, of food stamps or Section 8 housing or federally subsidized housing, uh, it will be used as evidence against you if you seek to get a, a green card or, or visa application. Uh, so this is for people who are here legally or seeking to come here legally. Uh, then there's the HUD, HUD regulations. I grew up in public housing in, in, uh, uh, in New York City. And uh, it, it, currently, if you are a family in public housing and one of your family members is undocumented, then the, the public housing authority merely does not give a subsidy equivalent for that person in your family. The rest of the family, you know, everyone could stay, but you don't get a subsidy for that one person that is uh, undocumented in your family. The new rules of the Trump administration say that if anyone in your family is undocumented, the entire family must be evicted. Everyone must leave. You cannot, no one, can, no one who is undocumented, uh, and no family of anyone who's undocumented can stay in public housing. The public housing authorities still haven't figured out what to do about that. The regulations were only promulgated a few months ago. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a new, the Trump administration is seeking a new point system for favoring the well-educated and those with skills uh, and reducing family reunification. Uh, uh, and uh, so that if you have a college degree or if, you, uh, or if you can show that you have some particular skills, 
you'd have priority in being admitted into the United States, and if you don't, you'd have lesser priority. Uh, and of course, this will increasingly favor immigration from South and East Asia, uh, where about 52% of the people who come in uh, have college degrees, and it will be to the detriment of people from Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, where basically six or six to 10% of people who come in have college degrees. Well, after 50 years of steady migration, the children of the original immigrants, most of them born and raised in this country, are on the cusp of transforming the United States, and you all are part of that. Too many, of course, are still dropping out of school, but thousands more are finishing high school and going to college. The California Cal State University system today is 45% Latino, the entire system of Cal State uh, is 45% Latino. We've seen the examples of progressive women of color, especially, who have taken huge leadership roles. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, of course, uh, uh, and uh, uh, other outspoken women of color who embody the rapidly changing face of America. Uh, people like Minnesota's Ilhan Omar, the, who came from, with her family as a refugee from Somalia. Uh, in the 1980s, Rashida Tlaib, the Michigan-born daughter of Palestinian refugees, and, and African-American Anna Presley. So what can any one individual do about the myriad of problems that affect our immigration system today? Well, if you're acting alone, not very much. But when you begin to act in concert with others, you can bring about astonishing changes. The key decision you must make is to get involved in social change not to be content with just receiving, achieving good grades, graduating from college, and finding your dream job with the highest possible salary, but to play a role as a citizen of this country. This year, 500,000 Latinos will turn 18, and most will be eligible to vote. Another 500,000 next year, and so on, for the next 20 years. Along with fellow students who trace their origins to Africa, and East and Southeast, uh, and, and Southwest Asia and tens of thousands of white students, many of you have been involved with the Dreamers, leading the movement to legalize not just the undocumented youth, but the parents and relatives as well. This is one of the true human rights issues of our time, and sooner or later, justice will prevail for the undocumented. But college students across the nation have set a center to other issues as well. Uh, the quest to stop the detention of migrant children and families from Central America at the border, ending police abuse, racial profiling, and mass incarceration of black and Latino youth for minor offenses, winning a big jump in the minimum wage and paid sick leave for all who are employed, leading the fight against uh, to confront climate change and end the reckless use of fossil fuels and save our planet, and achieving full equality for lesbians, gays, and transgender individuals. And many of you are involved in those causes as well. It is up to you to redefine what it is to be an American in the United States in the 21st century. But you must always do it with a firm grounding in the sacrifice and hard work of your parents and those who came before you, and the perseverance and belief that the millions of American Latinos and migrants who came before you have made enormous contributions and will continue to make contributions to the America we are becoming. I want to I'll, leave, I'll end it there and uh, see, see if there are any questions you might have. Thanks. Of our southwest border is actually decreasing. 
what we see is a shift in the population. So it used to be largely single men coming north to earn money to send home to their families. Now what we're seeing is a slow of asylum seekers, parents and their small children coming north. So we're seeing an increase in the number of asylum applications, but I want to be clear that we're not seeing an increase in absolute numbers of apprehensions. Um, those numbers are notoriously hard to get your fingers on, but it's pretty clear that we're not seeing an increase. The, the, the other point I want to make um, when you were talking about um, the, the um, folks coming to Europe and overwhelming the resources of Europe, I, 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 I just want to clarify that's a choice about how those resources are being spent. They are not, no one is overwhelming the absolute resources of the United States, of Europe, or of Australia. There are incredibly wealthy countries. The numbers of people we're seeing is something like 0.1% of these populations. When we talk about the Syrians coming across um, to Europe, it was very clear from the early days of, of the, the, the civil war in Syria um, that wealthy countries were not giving enough money to the refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon, and it became pretty clear that they were going to hit a breaking point. But that was a choice not to put resources there. It's a choice now to put resources into border enforcement rather than into adjudicating the asylum claims of these people who have legitimate claims to say. To say. So, so we also hear in the mainstream media talk about our resources being overwhelmed. Um, it, it, it's actually not a crisis of resources, it's a crisis about where we choose to put our money, and now it's a humanitarian crisis because of the way um, people at the border are being treated. So, so thank you right. so much. Right, and I agree completely with your, uh, with your clarifications on those issues here. Oh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yeah, um, hi, my name is Linda Stevenson. I'm a professor at Westchester University. Really great to hear your book is going to be renewed once more. <laughs> um, my question is, um, I have some students who work with immigration lawyers and uh, in internships. And I was talking with one of them, a student and a lawyer, and he said one of the issues that is really tricky for them is this, the question of how asylum is defined. Because um, without a change, criminal issues are often, the judges can easily say, oh, there's crime, sorry, we can't let all everybody in who's a victim of crime. And that, you know, if it's a political issue, that's partly why Chinese can make arguments and get accepted for asylum more. So what might be ways, strategies at the base that we can work on, educate about, uh, in terms of changing that definition, or what are people doing? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you that the, uh, and this is part of all the process of trying to reform immigration policy that, uh, because even the asylum laws were relatively new in the long history of, uh, of, of U.S. immigration policy. What I always try to tell people is that immigration law is not the Ten Commandments. Uh, it, it's, it, uh, immigration law uh, always is a, as, as most laws are, they are a reflection of the power balances in a society when the law was written. Uh, because obviously uh, uh, in the 1880s it was illegal for any Chinese to come into the United States. It was a Chinese Exclusion Act. That was the law. It wasn't right. <laughs> it was the law. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't ended until the 1940s when the United States needed China's support in World War II that the Exclusion Act was ended. Uh, and uh, so immigration law is really a question of decisions made by a society as to how they're going to control their labor flows in the future. Uh, and, uh, and they have to be adjusted uh, periodically. Uh, to, to, you know, one of the problems with the 65 law was that it created basically uh, equal country caps uh, for, um, uh, for immigrants from different countries. Uh, and uh, so, the, but the real world doesn't operate that way. The fact is that uh, there are certain countries that have provided the bulk of migrants to this country, you know, Mexico, the Philippines, China. So if you come from any one of those countries and you want to get on a waiting list to legally come into the country, you're, you're on the list for 20 years, right? If you want to come in from Madagascar or you want to come in from uh, some of the other countries that don't send as many migrants, your waiting list is not as long. So if you were going to adjust the immigration quotas, you would adjust them to re realistically reflect what are the countries that are sending people. So I think that in the same thing with refugee, uh, refugee uh, asylum, as the conditions in, this, in the world and society change, the laws have to be adjusted to reflect the most humane and sensible way 
to deal with, uh, with the problem. And, uh, and the, but the, as I said, the problem with immigration reform has been a battle. <laughs> it's been a constant battle to get law, a, a new law passed. Now since 2006, there were several attempts in 2007 and 2013, and each one, they, we couldn't get a majority of the Congress and the Senate, or sometimes when you did have a majority, you didn't have a super majority that you needed in the Senate to be able to get a bill voted on. Uh, so it needs pressure from people to say, we gotta fix, we gotta get our laws into, to coincide with the reality of our situation right now in immigration. So, yeah. Hi, uh, Kimberly Tomczak. I'm an immigration attorney in Philadelphia representing mostly uh, asylum seekers and removal proceedings. Um, one question that I have is, you know, I do believe that we can make change individually, person-to-person um, -person contact, and I do agree with you that the wall of ignorance is one of our biggest hurdles in, in true change. Do you have any suggestions for us as individuals who are here today? Obviously not everyone is here today. Um, how can we kind of overcome that wall of ignorance on a person-to-person -person basis. I have plenty of people in my life on my Facebook feed that disagree with almost everything that I believe in. Um, so I'm sure we all face that to some level. So what suggestions would you have for us? Well, I think the biggest problem, again, is uh, taking the time uh, or having the people who you talk to take the time to look at the problem in a historical context. Well, the Amer American people... <laughs> We don't learn from history, so we keep repeating the same mistakes.